Good evening, and welcome to our Good Friday service here at Ojai Presbyterian Church. The way in which we have marked Good Friday over the years is what we call a tenebrae service, which means a service of darkness. While that sounds very ominous, let me explain what that is. The lights on the candelabra are lit this evening. And what happens is, as we read the story of Jesus' betrayal and arrest and trial and crucifixion and death, after each reading, we extinguish one of these candles, the candles that mark that the light of the world has been diminished and leaves at the cross. And as we read this story, we are reminded not only of the seriousness with which Jesus brought the kingdom of God into being, but if you listen closely, there's also a deep resonant note of love and of light. And after each reading, we will be led in a musical interpretation of that reading. And the vision is, is that the reading of the story and the reflection of the music draws us into this moment that we might not only take this moment seriously, but also experience a love that overcomes betrayal, that overcomes evil, and even overcomes death to bring new life. I'm glad that you've joined us this evening. Let us enter into worship. Our story of Holy Week begins with a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When evening came, he settled down with the twelve. As they were eating, he said, I'm telling you the truth. One of you will betray me. They were extremely upset and began to say one by one, it's not me, is it, Master? It's one who dipped his hand with me in the dish, Jesus replied. That's the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is on his way, as the Bible said it would happen, but it's misery for the man who hands him over. It would be better for that man if he'd never been born. At this, Judas, who was planning to betray him, said, It isn't me, is it, teacher? You've just said so, he replied. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples. Take it and eat it, he said. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. Drink this, all of you, he said. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But let me tell you this. I will not drink any more from this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus. 
Our story continues. So Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane. You sit here, he said to the disciples, while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him and began to be very upset and distressed. My soul is overwhelmed with grief, he said, even to death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Then going a little further on, he fell on his face and prayed, my father, he said, if it is possible, please, please let this cup go away from me. But not what I want, but what you want. He came back to the disciples and found them asleep. So, he said to Peter, couldn't you keep watch with me for a single hour? Watch and pray so that you don't get pulled down into the time of testing. The spirit is eager, but the body is weak. Again, for the second time, he went off and said, my father, if it's not possible for this to pass unless I drink it, let your will be done. Again, he came and found them asleep. Their eyes were heavy. Once more, he left them and went away. He prayed for the third time, using the same words once again. Then he came back to the disciples. You can sleep now, he said, and have a good rest. Look, the time has come, and the Son of Man is given over into the hands of wicked people. Get up and let's be going. Look, here comes the one who's going to betray me. While Jesus was still speaking, there was Judas, one of the twelve. He had come with a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. The one who was intending to betray him gave them a sign. The one I kiss, that's him. Grab hold of him. So he went up at once to Jesus and said, Greetings, teacher, and kissed him. My friend, said Jesus, what are you doing here? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. This is the word of the Lord. Dark Gethsemane, ye 
our story continues. Meanwhile, Peter sat outside in the courtyard. One of the servant girls came up to him. You were with Jesus of the Galilean too, weren't you? She said. He denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. He went out to the gateway. Another girl saw him and said to the people who were there, This fellow was with Jesus the Nazarene. Once more, he denied it, this time swearing, I don't know the man. After a little while, the people standing around came up and said to Peter, You really are one of them. Look, the way you talk makes it obvious. Then he began to curse and swear, I don't know the man. And then all at once, the cock crowed. And Peter remembered. He remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and cried like a baby. This is the word of the Lord. Our story continues. So Jesus stood in front of the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. If you say so, replied Jesus. The chief priests and elders poured out their accusations against him, but he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear all this evidence they're bringing against you? He gave him no answer, not even a word, which quite astonished the governor. 
the high priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. So when the governor came back to them again and asked, which of the two do you want me to release for you? They said, Barabbas. So what shall I do with Jesus, the so-called Messiah? asked Pilate. Let him be crucified, they all said. Why? asked Pilate. What's he done wrong? But they shouted all the louder, let him be crucified. Pilate saw that it was no good. In fact, there was a riot brewing. So he took some water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm not guilty of this man's blood, he said. It's your problem. Let his blood be on us, answered all the people, and on our children. Then Pilate released Barabbas for them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the barracks and gathered the whole regiment together. They took off his clothes and dressed him up in a scarlet military cloak. They wove a crown out of thorns and stuck it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. Then they knelt down in front of him. Greetings, king of the Jews, they said, making fun of him. This is the word of the Lord. Two other criminals were taken away with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Father, said Jesus, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They divided his clothes, casting lots for them. The people stood around and watched. The rulers hurled abuse at him. He rescued others, they said. Let him try rescuing himself if he really is the Messiah, God's chosen one. The soldiers added their taunts, coming up and offering him cheap wine. If you're the king of the Jews, they said, rescue yourself. The charge was written above him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the bad characters who was hanging there began to insult him. Aren't you the Messiah, he said? Rescue yourself and us too. But the other one told him off. Don't you fear God, he said. You're sharing the same fate that he is. In our case, it's fair enough. We're getting exactly what we asked for. But this fellow hasn't done anything out of order. Jesus, he went on, remember me when you finally become king. I'm telling you the truth, replied Jesus. You'll be with me in paradise this very day. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
seat for crimes that I have done. He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and show The story continues. At midday, there was darkness over all the land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus shouted out in a powerful voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? When the bystanders heard it, some of them said, he's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a pole and gave it to him to drink. Well then, he declared, let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. But Jesus, with another loud shout, breathed his last. The temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion, who was standing facing him, saw that he died in this way, he said, this fellow really was God's son. This is the word of the Lord. Survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gains I count. his hands 
from his feet sorrow and love flow mingle down dear air such love and sorrow me Thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature's mind that Far too small, a love so amazing and so, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my Good Friday is a tricky evening to preach. In some ways, it's straightforward. <clears throat> there is the story of betrayal, of trial, and of crucifixion. These parts of the story we're actually quite familiar with. But those, while all parts of the story don't make up the whole. So often on Good Friday, we focus on the cross, and that's an appropriate focus for Good Friday. But what is it that we're actually saying about the cross? When I worked in camping ministry in college, each week during the summer, we'd have a different speaker that would come up and share the gospel with the students from the various churches that were at camp that week. And we as a staff knew every week that Wednesday would be the day they would talk about the cross. And each one tried to approach it in their own way. Some tried to water it down to just an unpleasant experience that Jesus had to go through. Others tried to go into all the horrific detail of what execution by crucifixion looked like. But to be honest, I don't remember any of them ever explaining what was going on on the cross. And yet, the cross is an absolutely critical part of the story, not just of Jesus' death, but of God's love. And it seems incongruous to talk about God's love and talk about the cross. But the two are linked together. You know, you hear that passage so often from the Gospel of John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But so often we think when we read that, or I should say as we hear it preached, what we often hear when people go into the gruesome details of the cross, what we hear is, for God so hated the world that he killed his only son. But John's proclamation of God's love is actually the key to understanding what the cross is all about. When you read the whole big picture of the gospel starting in Genesis, there is the story of God's creation and God declaring it good. And then when you get to the end of the creation story on the Friday, God's work is finished and God rests on the Sabbath. 
Then you hear of Adam and Eve, God's good creation, becoming separated from God by their unwillingness to be God's good creatures. They want to be more than the creature, only to discover that they cannot, and they cannot reclaim their innocence. So when you move through the whole story of the Gospels all the way to this point that Megan read tonight, when you come to the cross, on the cross, Jesus says these words. It is finished. The same words that are spoken on the last working day of creation. God looked upon all he had made and it was good. And so what you have on the cross is Jesus dying an awful death so that the brokenness of this world, the seeking an identity apart from God, is overcome. God so loved the world that he gave Christ so that in Christ's actions the separation, the brokenness, and all the wrong directions that the world has chosen to take are overcome overcome with a love that willingly gives itself to the cross, knowing what it will entail. A love that willingly gives itself. Because God so loved the world, us, that God wants to bring all things back into order. And so while the cross does deal with personal sin, it also deals with social evil. The brokenness of our world, the broken systems, the racism, the hatred, the political striving, the small views of the world where we find identity that separate us, as opposed to the large view of the world that we are God's children destined and created to live together in such a way that it brings glory to God. The cross is the place where rebellion is finished and reconciliation and newness and a new purpose has begun. So this is a heavy evening. It is a moment where we pause and say we are here because in love God went to the cross so that through the cross we might live again. But even more than that, we are here to say that God so loved the world that God went to the cross to redeem us that we might be about redeeming the world for God's kingdom. You see, the cross has everything to do with society, not just individuals. It has to do with confronting the broken powers of this world and saying, we, not just I, we no longer belong to them. And we can turn away from them because we are loved with a love that gave the only Son that all who believe in him might have life abundantly. So Easter which is coming but not here yet, 
is the celebration of that life, that newness, that overcoming the brokenness in the world with love and with grace and humility and justice, entering into the world. It's a moment of celebration because God's newness, God's new creation has come. But that means that on this night we confront the old world and all its brokenness in ourselves and in our larger lives together. And when they rear their ugly heads, we say as Jesus said, it is finished and live into the new. And in this period between Good Friday and Easter morning, I invite you in God's love, not in guilt, but in God's love, to look into your own hearts to see where you cling to the old and to put it behind you. Because in love, it has lost its power. Please join with me in prayer. Lord God, as we pause on this holy of nights, We ask that your love would indeed set us free. That we might live today in this world that belongs to you. As citizens of your kingdom. Seeking your purposes. Of releasing the captives. Enabling the blind to see. The lame to walk and proclaiming the good news of your love to all who have ears to hear. In your name we pray. Amen. Our story concludes. After this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take Jesus' body away. He was a disciple of Jesus, but he kept it secret because he was afraid of the Judeans. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took his body. Nicodemus came too, the man who at first had visited Jesus by night. He brought a concoction of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds in weight. They took Jesus' body and wrapped it up in cloths with the spices according to the normal Judean burial customs. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. In the garden there was a new tomb where nobody had ever been buried. So because the tomb was nearby and because of the Judean day of preparation, they buried Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. the 
Now, as you go forth into this good Friday night, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be the last and only word you hear. May the love of God lead you into the kingdom. And may the Spirit walk you to Easter morning and the abundant life that awaits in God's new world. Amen and good night.